we're totally not out of the woods yet and with SARS-CoV-2. And as we look across the social and financial landscape, we've got a really important update here for you today. My headline for today, the title of all this is Diagnosis Too Many Elites. Can pathologists give uh, diagnoses? Not really. Uh, not so much um, in this case. But what I am good at is forensics. I like digging through stuff and figuring out what went wrong. So we're going to do a little autopsy on uh, the U.S. financial system, the Federal Reserve today. It's pretty ugly uh, when you get right down to it. Hello, everyone. This is Dr. Chris Martinson. This is These are some of my uh, credentials you can see here. Graduated from Duke University with a PhD in pathology. Here's some papers of mine you could look up if you wanted to make sure that that's the case, that I am who I am. Uh, before we get into the Federal Reserve and all the other stuff, let's just very quickly go through what we're seeing in the numbers. Hey, get out the big foam finger with a number one on it for the United States. Uh, this is a log chart here on the left. See that log chart right there? And notice that, um, yep, uh, things were actually starting to dip down a little bit. Now they're starting to dip up again. But the United States is reliably over 20,000 cases of COVID a day. There's some countries out there that have gotten all the way down and flatlined. I know it's hard to make sense of the spaghetti going on over here. Um, but by by and large, uh, the United States is pretty much the leader here. And so, well, you know why that is. In Prosper, our book, Adam Taggart and I, we talk about eight forms of capital. One of them is cultural capital. So some cultures deal with things better than others. Um, some are very good at crises. Some are much more nurturing. Every culture has pros and cons, but I do think that the United States culture is kind of unsuited for a thing like a long-lasting pandemic, which requires uh, both a very logical and a very consistent approach from the top down, it requires you to have actual leaders, not managers. It requires a population that has some fortitude, knows how to stick with things, and has the right story in mind. So it's um, some areas in the United States, it's not one culture. Some areas are doing really well. I give my uh, community here in Western Massachusetts very high marks. Everybody's wearing a mask. We all get it. There's social distancing. It all looks good. But uh, other communities are really struggling. All right, one quick piece uh, I couldn't resist before we go into the financial data and things like that in the protest. Oh, no, not again. Uh, this story came out about a Dallas woman battling coronavirus again. Uh, this came out on June 15th. Here's the story. This woman, McKee, she is sick with the coronavirus again, she told NBC5. She wouldn't wish it on her worst enemy. To be alone in the hospital, not have anyone you know. She said tearfully, she tested positive for COVID-19 in February, and she was diagnosed after feeling clear and obvious symptoms. I had a dry cough like you would not believe it would not stop. She fought the virus from home and beat it. She even donated plasma twice after testing positive for antibodies, thinking she was in the clear. So uh, because she's uh, actually tested positive for antibodies and she had a positive COVID-19 test, Pretty sure she had it. She was COVID positive back there in February. Uh, of course, you could always have a false positive, So, but but it would be very unlikely to have uh, the antibodies and a positive test. So pretty sure she had it. I felt great finally doing something good coming out of the hell that I've been through because I'm going to help up to eight people with this plasma, she said. But this past Friday, McKee went to the hospital with high blood pressure and a headache. She never imagined four months later she'd test positive for COVID-19 Again, I was floored when it was positive, she said of her diagnosis. Epidemiologist at UT um, Southwestern, not connected to McKee's case, said catching the coronavirus twice is possible, but appears to be uncommon and that we don't really know how serious the illness is the second time compared to the first time. So, uh, it, it, yeah, a lot we don't know. Remember, a lot of unknowns around this particular virus. But I thought that was just an interesting thing to observe. And what's uh, another piece we can pull out of this is this idea that because she had tested positive for antibodies. It's not the case that she was one of those people who never developed an antibody response. And so that's why she came uh, down with it a second time. So this speaks possibly for some people. We don't know why it, it happened for this woman. We don't have a lot of other cases to point to. We know that China at the time was talking about people coming back in, testing positive again. A little murky as to whether those people were symptomatic again or just testing positive at a later point in time which may or may not have anything to do with being under a, a disease load of the virus, uh, right? It's a lot of reasons you could test positive and still not be sick with the virus, such as it's all neutralized with your antibodies, um, and uh, you would still find the RNA of the virus, but it wouldn't be attacking you. 
what I'm getting at here, unfortunately, is the idea that even having antibodies, um, and by the way, having enough antibodies to donate plasma, if you have enough of an antibody response like that, uh, you would think that you would be protected from getting the virus again. So what, all we know is that this woman, four months after first getting it, uh, she seems to have gotten it again. So we're going to now wonder if the antibodies, for some people, don't last even four months. All right. Let's move on here. Uh, really important. Uh, this is a really important update today. I'm going to cover some really important concepts, really big topics, because we're at a really critical period of history right here. And how we all conduct ourselves and how you conduct yourself personally is going to be very important to your outcome personally and then to all of our collective outcomes depending on, on how we do things going forward. Now, remember, I've always been very sympathetic to the idea that we have a large balancing act. You know, you want to stop the pandemic. You want to make sure your hospitals aren't overloaded. By the way, we think we're seeing some hospital overloading showing up in Texas now. Maybe they can distribute the load so it's not all of Texas, but some. they got four hotspot hospitals there that are uh, doing poorly at this point. And we want to balance all of that against keeping the economy going. And, of course, we could have kept the economy going a lot faster, a lot more easily, a lot better if everybody had just worn a mask early on. If we'd gotten that clear, consistent message out, like, Right there in early, mid-January, just president comes out, CDC's lined up, FDA's right there, uh, NIH, NIAID, all the big players in the United States. You got the World Health Organization and whatever the other countries are involved in uh, wanting to battle this in the right way. They would have all come together and said, hey, everybody's got to wear masks. We're going to practice some social distancing. We can do this, just like New Zealand did, right? Um, you know, thoughtful and intelligent. All right. Let's talk about this needing to keep the economy going here because it is important and we're already over the tips of our skis on this particular story. So I'm going to turn now to a really important piece of research that uh, it's only two minutes long that uh, presented at a TED Talk that really has stuck with me over the years. And I've shown it a lot to people because I think it explains a lot. All right. And uh, let's just listen in here now. I'm going to turn that off for a second and... The final experiment that I want to mention to you is our fairness study. Uh, and so this, this, this became a very famous study, and there's now many more, because after we did this about 10 years ago, uh, it became uh, very well known. And we did that originally with capuchin monkeys, and I'm going to show you the first experiment that we did. It has now been done with dogs, and with birds, and with chimpanzees, um, with, but with Sarah Brosnan, we started out with capuchin monkeys. So what we did is we put two capuchin monkeys side by side. Again, these animals, they live in a group. They know each other. We take them out of the group, put them in a test chamber. And there's a very simple task that they need to do. And if you give both of them cucumber for the task, the two monkeys side by side, they're perfectly willing to do this 25 times in a row. So cucumber, even though it's really only water in my opinion, but cucumber <laughs> is perfectly fine for them. Now, if you give the partner grapes, the, the food preferences of my capuchin monkeys correspond exactly with the prices in the supermarket. And so if you give them grapes, it's a far better food, uh, then you create inequity between them. So that's the experiment we did. Recently, we videotaped it with new monkeys who had never done the task, uh, thinking that maybe they would have a stronger reaction, and that turned out to be right. The one on the left is the monkey who gets cucumber. The one on the right is the one who gets grapes. The one who gets cucumber, note that the first piece of cucumber is perfectly fine. The first piece she eats. Uh, then she sees the other one getting grape, and you will see what happens. So she gives a rock to us. That's the task. And we give her a piece of cucumber, and she eats it. The other one needs to give a rock to us. And that's what she does. And she gets a grape. And she eats it. The other one sees that. She gives a rock to us now, gets again cucumber. She tests the rock now against the wall. She needs to give it to us. And she gets cucumber again. So this is basically the Wall Street protest that you see here. Yeah, so... Uh, it's not just the Wall Street protests, it's uh, all sorts of protests that are going on. And this explains a lot. 
It explains a lot because we are all as a social creature, and he mentioned in this uh, TED Talk earlier that you can run the same experiment with dogs, with cats, um, with you know basically any any animal that that's uh, used to operating in some sort of a social environment. Fairness is really important, and and when you have things going on that are deeply unfair, you're breaking some sort of a social contract. But do you see that monkey shaking? Rah, it's got shaking the cage. Doesn't like the unfairness of it all. So this is a really important concept. So what we're going to look at here is the degree to which we have a very, very deep structural unfairness and a racial unfairness that's going on in the United States. And it's being absolutely, absolutely driven by the policies of the Federal Reserve. But before we go there, uh, this article, I read it a long time ago. It really stuck with me. I want to share this with you, too, by Peter Turchin here. This comes from 2013. It's just as relevant as it is today. And Peter had put out a, a series of um, predictions based on a model. It's not really a prediction. It's, it's more of a, a modeled outcome that he saw coming a long time ago, more than a decade ago, which basically pretty much reads like where we are today. So uh, very, pretty important to listen to what he wrote. There's a big article here. You can read the whole thing. I've just pulled out uh, two or three, I think three pieces of this. Let's look at this. Really, really good stuff. Complex human societies, including our own, are fragile. They are held together by an invisible web of mutual trust and social cooperation. This web can fray easily, resulting in a wave of political instability, internal conflict, and sometimes outright social collapse. Analysis of past societies shows that these destabilizing historical trends develop slowly, last many decades, and are slow to subside. Uh-oh. The Roman Empire, Imperial China, and medieval and early modern England and France suffered such cycles, to cite a few examples. In the U.S., the last long period of instability began in the 1850s and lasted through the Gilded Age and the violent 1910s. We now see the same forces in the contemporary U.S. Of about 30 detailed indicators I developed for tracing these historical cycles reflecting popular well-being, inequality, social cooperation, and its inverse, polarization and conflict, Almost all have been moving in the wrong direction in the last three decades. Hmm. Let's look at this. How does growing economic inequality lead to political instability? Partly, this correlation reflects a direct causal connection. High inequality is corrosive of social cooperation and willingness to compromise. And waning cooperation means more discord and political infighting. Perhaps more important... Economic inequality is also a symptom of deeper social changes, which have gone largely unnoticed. All right, back it up. Remember, uh, we're primates. We just we need our fairness and justice, and uh, we don't like it when it's grapes for them but cucumbers for us. And so that's what Peter's been writing about and noting about a long time ago was that this economic inequality and wealth inequality, this is a really, really big deal that's going on. But this... Uh, let me get to this in a second, this title, Too Many Elites. <clears throat> Excuse me. Rich Americans, continuing on here, tend to be more politically active than the rest of the population. They support candidates who share their views and values. They sometimes run for office themselves. Yet the supply of political offices has stayed flat. There are still 100 senators and 435 representatives, the same numbers as in 1970. In technical terms, such a situation is known as elite overproduction. So, hey, guess what? Elites are just like uh, everybody else and just like primates. There's only so many resources to go around, and when resources get tight, you fight over them. Squabble, infighting, backstabbing, uh, compete, whatever the language is. And so when you have too many elites, uh, this can happen. And so he noted that this sort of thing happened before in uh, Roman Empire, Imperial China, early uh, modern England, places like that. All right, continuing on here, he writes... Past waves of political instability, such as the civil wars of the late Roman Republic, the French wars of religion, and the American Civil War, had many interlinking causes and circumstances unique to their age. But a common thread in the eras we studied was elite overproduction. The other two important elements were stagnating and declining living standards of the general population and increasing indebtedness of the state. Oops. Three big factors, elite overproduction, stagnating and declining living standards, bing, got that too, and increasing indebtedness of the state. All right, we have all three of those things going on right now. Elite overproduction generally leads to more intra-elite competition that gradually undermines the spirit of cooperation, which is followed by ideological polarization and fragmentation of the political class. 
This happens because the more contenders there are, the more of them end up on the losing side. A large class of disgruntled elite wannabes, often well-educated and highly capable, has been denied access to elite positions. All right. That's exactly the situation we're in right now. Again, this was written way back in 2013. It feels very prescient today. Here's the punchline from all of this, and this leads us right into what I want to talk about with the Federal Reserve today. Um, Preventing catastrophe. We should expect many years of political turmoil peaking in the 2020s, and because complex societies are much more fragile than we assume, there's a chance of a catastrophic failure of some kind, with a default on U.S. government bonds being among the less frightening possibilities. Of course, catastrophe isn't preordained. History shows a real indeterminacy about the route societies follow out of instability waves. Some end with social revolutions in which the rich and powerful are overthrown. This is what happened to the southern elites decimated in the Civil War, beggared when their main assets, slaves, were freed, and excluded from national power in Washington. In other cases, recurrent civil wars result in a permanent fragmentation of the state and society. In some cases, however, societies come through relatively unscathed by adopting a series of judicious reforms initiated by elites who understand that we are all in this boat together. Ha! So this is why I bring this stuff up, because I I would like to go down this path if we could. That's why I do what I do. I prefer to go down the easy route, not the hard route. Can we change by insight rather than by pain? Let's talk about that last paragraph right there, or sentence. Both. In some cases, however, societies come through relatively unscathed by adopting a series of judicious reforms initiated by elites who understand that we are all in this boat together. Now, the United States Federal Reserve has been taking the exact opposite of this approach for over a decade now, and they've recently put on the afterburners on this and making it really, really, really a deeply structurally unfair system, which is why I'm here to say the Federal Reserve is the problem today. I'm sure it's staffed with some well-meaning people, but as an organization, as an institution, as well as its top leadership, they are absolutely 100% the problem right now and uh, adding to the problem. And they've done this over and over and over again. And the reason I fight for fairness, because I understand the capuchin monkey uh, thing with grapes and cucumbers, is because of this quote from Plutarch from way long time ago. So we have had a long time to figure out and learn this. An imbalance between rich and poor is the oldest and most fatal ailment of all republics. And that really echoes um, what we're finding out here and here from, uh, from Peter Turchin's work as well, right? Stagnating, declining living standards, indebtedness, elite overproduction, but as well the deep structural unfairness that comes, right? This growing economic inequality piece that we see right here. So growing economic inequality. That's a bad thing. That's a bad thing if you care about your uh, republic. It's a bad thing if you care about social stability. It's a bad thing if you want to live in a peaceful and quiet and non-tumultuous period of time. That's why it's a bad thing. I mean, it's a, uh, you know, having giant wealth and income gaps is a good thing if you want instability, protests, chaos, and things like that. Because remember, this is what it looks like. George Floyd, whoops, uh, the, let me get the other highlight right here. George Floyd, the black man who was murdered by that police officer, that was the tip of the iceberg. But under here, I, I put this up a number of days ago. I said there are other things that are contributing to the friction and the things we're seeing, including no accountability, especially for the elites, a very unfair wealth distribution in the Federal Reserve picking winners and losers. We're, you know, stagnant wages. Of course, I had that in there as well. Um, But I really want to focus on these two because this is a major, major driver right down here. The unfair wealth distribution in the Federal Reserve picking winners and losers. Um, so let's see, where should I go first with this? I got this a little out of order. Yeah, let, let's, um, let's start here. I think the protests have something to do with this, for instance. So because the Federal Reserve has been throwing tons and tons of money into the markets, trillions and trillions of dollars, they've just been buying up financial assets of all stripes. They've been buying stocks or are contributing to the buying of stocks, bonds, corporate bonds, junk bonds, uh, you know, government bonds, all kinds of things. And because they've been doing that, um, we get these crazy, crazy things. Let me start right here. So right now, stocks are at all-time highs or right at them. Look at this. This green line shows where the NASDAQ closed at today. And it's higher than, like, really, the economy today. And 
the stock ownership share of that that's represented by the Nasdaq 100, really, you would you would think that it's worth more today than it was a year ago. I mean, a lot more. Uh, that's that's what we're supposed to believe, of course. But it's not worth a lot more. It's just that the economy's fallen away and stocks have gone up, meaning that the claims of stocks on the economy, those who own the stocks, own a much, much larger share of the economy today than they did back here a year ago. You got that going on. How about this? Corporate bonds are at all-time highs. If you're not familiar with bonds, they're, as the yield goes down, the price goes up. It's a seesaw. Vice versa. As the yields go up, prices go down. Here we're seeing yields just plummeting on corporate bonds. There was a little bit of stress right here, or that big doing that we got right there because of the coronavirus, and then it just immediately got slammed back down. And why did it uh, get slammed back down like that? Because the Federal Reserve said, no, we have to bail out uh, the owners of these particular bonds. We have to make sure that people who bought these bonds don't lose any money on them, right? So here are bond, bond corporate bonds right now are at the all-time highest, most expensive they've ever been, okay? So John Husband, who I follow, he's a great guy and a really, really good uh, market commentator. He wrote here, I want you to understand something. Corporate bond yields are near historic lows. So they were near when he wrote this. They're actually at historic lows right now. See that little spike in March? That that thing right there, right there that little spike in March? That, that little spike right there. See that? That's what the Fed considers dysfunctional. Instead of using CARES funds for Main Street, they're buying bonds from investors to limit their exposure to loss. Okay? That's what's going on here. So I wrote about that at Federal Reserve is dead set on pushing the widest ever wealth gap to socially destructive levels. Capitalism for you. So, oh, you can't pay your rent. You're out. Uh, can't pay your mortgage. Lose your house. But socialism for the wealthy. Here they are. Just because of that little tiny, tiny little bump. That little tiny bump right there. That little bump. The Federal Reserve stepped in and made sure that the people who owned those bonds didn't lose any money, and so they bailed him out. And I said, I'm now waiting for BlackRock, who is administering a lot of these funds for the Fed, BlackRock BR, the BlackRock Real Return ETF to be created to rub our noses in this latest injustice, and that would have the ticker symbol, brrr, right, to uh, connote the printing press. Um, other people writing in, uh, here's Matthew uh, writing in saying, Jay Powell and at Federal Reserve need to stop. With their God complex, the country is fed up with handouts to big banks and over-leveraged corporations and individuals. They need to stop with the purchase of high-yield debt, encouraging leveraging and promoting moral hazard. I agree, Matthew, 100%. Stock market update wrote, the Fed put is approaching its limit, and that put is the uh, backstopping the market so that so-called investors don't lose any money. The Fed's continuous intervention to fix the smallest spike or smallest drop proves the Fed has lost confidence on effectiveness of its own policy. The Fed has no way out, so decided to go all in. The end is near. So um, lots of people losing faith here in the Fed and how it operates. And of course, it's gotten so ingrained in everything right now, we've just totally lost the plot line. This is the CNBC edition of losing the plot line. Uh, futures point to a 700-point loss. More government stimulus needed? Like, oh my gosh, if stocks ever go down, the only appropriate response is to say, we need more government stimulus, obviously, um, you know, anytime it goes down. So that's that's just crazy talk right there, right? So that's what's been happening. The Federal Reserve has stepped in and thrown tons and tons of money at the markets, and they made stocks go up. Uh, in the case of the NASDAQ, right at all-time highs, we've got corporate bonds at all-time highs. We even got this crazy stuff, which is called a garbage portfolio. It's an equal-weighted portfolio of all the listed U.S. companies that have a credit default swap of more than a thousand basis points. And so that means that's that's insurance. A credit default swap is insurance you would have to buy if you wanted to know if you bought a corporate bond that it's um that if that bond defaulted, you would get paid, right? So you'd get your principal back. Uh so a thousand basis point uh credit default swap is 10%. It's like this 10 per, giant 10%. By the time you have a 1000 basis point credit default swap, you're a junky junky company. You are garbage. You are absolutely garbage. Like nobody should touch your stuff. No nobody should own your stocks or your bonds. But get this. If you owned if you owned uh the garbage uh portfolio of just pure garbage through this period when the Fed was bailing everything out, 
Look at the massive, massive gains. I mean, this is not this is nothing. A thirty percent gain here on the MCSI USA uh, index right here. But look at this. Look at this huge, huge, huge gain. Right, right. This is this is a thirty percent gain. This is a two hundred percent gain in garbage companies. How do you get something like that? Right. How do you get a crazy market with uh, with garbage yields like that? Well, the way you do that is the Federal Reserve buys trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars of financial assets. Also, that just as John uh, Hussman said, just so that they can um, make sure that investors don't take any losses, because that's what the Fed is really about here, right here. They're limiting investors' exposure to losses. John very, very politely put it, right? And so this is what we're seeing. This is the Federal Reserve destroying society. That's what they're really doing by picking winners and losers. So how are they doing that? What do, what do I mean by that? Well, when the Fed buys things, and I hear, hear listen, I understand. Let, let me take the Fed side from it. They're going to say, look, Chris, look, everybody, we understand it's totally not entirely fair what we're doing, but it's also not completely unfair because if we didn't step into these markets, if we didn't protect them, the markets would fall and then corporations would find access to capital drying up and people would lose their jobs. So what we're really doing is stabilizing markets and preventing really bad things from happening. What's left unsaid in that argument is the other side of that, which is that when the Fed does those things, uh, they are also picking winners and losers. They are choosing that some people are going to get fantastically stinking rich by driving up the prices of bonds and stocks and things like that. And everybody else is going to be kind of left out of that story. And so that's really feeding grapes to one group of people and cucumbers at best to another group of people. So so let's look at this um, very quickly here. So when the Fed drives up uh, assets, right, what do we mean by that? Well, they buy stocks and bonds and things like that. Uh, I know the Fed doesn't buy stocks directly yet, but they kind of do um, indirectly for sure. Through their proxy agents, uh, companies like uh, Citadel, which uh, you know controls a lot of the daily trading through whatever the plunge protection team is doing. Uh, maybe by funneling swap lines with uh, the Swiss National Bank, which can buy stocks directly in the U.S. markets and does uh, whatever whatever the story is. It's a big club, right? And and they're uh, busy uh, propping up financial assets. Well, that's what the Fed does. It buys financial assets to make sure financial assets goes up. So first question is, who owns financial assets? Well, the first thing you would notice here is that financial assets here in this uh, light blue right here, they are owned almost entirely by the top 1%. So by buying financial assets, look at the look at the other 80%. The bottom 80% of the United States owns about 10% of financial assets. So and uh, here we've got about 75% in the top 1%. Financial assets, stocks, bonds, things like that. So when the Fed goes out and makes financial assets go screaming higher in price, right? Like this, screaming higher in price, right? And uh, this is, because this is going down, this is screaming higher in price, right? and uh, makes garbage companies go screaming higher, right? Um, where'd my garbage company go? Yeah, it makes this go screaming higher in price. They're just essentially saying, hey, whoever is the lucky owners of these stocks and bonds and garbage companies, they're going to be the ones who going to just be the winners in this story. So the Federal Reserve is picking the winners in the story, and they're picking the top 1%. They're not picking the next 19%. They're not picking the bottom uh, 80% to a much, much lesser degree. The second thing we need to say about that, though, um, and it's just so obvious, right? The Federal Reserve absolutely makes financial assets go higher, which makes the owners of those assets wealthier. That is not a hard set of dots to connect. There's only two dots. The one dot one, the Federal Reserve makes asset prices go higher. Dot two, the owners of those assets get wealthier. That is so easy, right? Well, guess what? <laughs> you got to laugh about this one. Uh, Jerome Powell, he seems like a nice enough guy. But honestly, he's just a bald-faced liar. And um, here's why. He says, Powell said Fed policies absolutely don't add to inequality. No, <laughs> they absolutely do. You can't say that. You can't come out and say the exact opposite of what is true. So, Jerome Powell, uh, you're going to get an F- minus on this one. I have to give you a minus uh, because that is just, that's absolutely a lie. And it's just, it's grotesque. Shame on you for doing that. That's awful. And then he doubled down on the lies uh, just a little bit later than that. I, I wrote here, either Jay's a good man and a bad job, or he's a rather pedestrian sort of psychopath. Not the smooth lying sort, but the type that gives the answer below. He said here, inequality 
has been something that's been increasingly with us for four decades, and it's not really related to monetary policy. What? What are you talking about? It's absolutely related to monetary policy. Of course inequality is related to monetary policy, because... Uh, we have an unequal distribution of financial assets, and your monetary policy drives those financial assets higher in price, which means that the people who own those financial assets, remember the old one and two thing? One, two, uh, that's, so you can't say that. This is, this is just an absolute uh, disgusting lie right here. So um, no good, okay? Sorry, Jay Powell. You seem like a nice guy, but this is, this is such a fumbling, uh, ridiculous, and quite frankly, angering statement. This is really angering. People should not be giving the Federal Reserve any respect at this point in time. They are picking winners and losers. They've decided a grossly undivided uh, country is what they that we all need and want and deserve. They've decided who's going to win in this story, and they decide who's going to lose in this story, and that's the end of that. So who, who's a loser in this story? Well, if you have money in the bank and you're earning 0% interest rate on that, you know why you're earning 0%? Because the Federal Reserve has decided you should get zero on that. They decide what the, the interest rates are going to be. Not the market, None of that stuff. The Federal Reserve has decided, eh, zero for savers. So over the past 12 years, because the Federal Reserve has held an, uh, effectively a zero interest rate policy, about $1.2 trillion of interest income did not go to savers. That would have been moms, dads, grandmas, grandpas, all that stuff. And because we didn't have $1.2 trillion in savings interest going to those households, you know what else we didn't get? New business formation and household formation. Because very typically, uh, mothers, fathers, grandparents they will help out their children and grandchildren. And if they don't have, if they're missing $1.2 trillion in interest income, they couldn't do $1.2 trillion of household formation and small business uh, formation and things like that. So that's absolutely been the case. That inequality has been driven by the Fed policy, right? But it gets a little darker than that even. Um, and so the other thing I guess I, I need to, to speak to here is that the Fed's actions are inherently racist as well. And I say that because this is just share of households with indirect or direct stock ownership, saying that we see here white households have a much higher proportion of stock ownership. So if you drive stock prices a lot higher, you are disproportionately affecting uh, white households over black households. And they know that. They know that absolutely. No question about it. But this is just the share of households. This doesn't really actually show how profoundly uh, large this gap actually is. For that way, I had to go over to the census.gov uh, site and find uh, this table here where they show that the total net worth of families broken out by race, and this includes assets at financial institutions, other interest-earning assets, stocks and mutual fund shares, equity in business or profession, equity in your own home, even equity in motor vehicles. So when you look at this across households, White alone, but let's go white alone, not Hispanic, this one right here. That average household net worth of 143000 compared to black alone of just $12,920. So basically, uh, just grossly speaking here, that's a 11x difference. 11x. Uh, just doing some math in my head. It's close to 12x, but it's not yet. Um, okay, so there's so 11x. Uh, and so if you if if you're saying, oh, the Federal Reserve, oh, no, they, they're just driving up financial assets because the markets could stabilize. How can we not also be talking about that there's an 11 fold greater proportion of wealth and uh, unequal wealth, grape style wealth, right? Where the, when the Fed prints money and hands it to markets and some people uh, make a lot of money and get rich off of that. That's grapes. That's pure grapes. Those people didn't earn that. They didn't work for it. None of that stuff, right? It was handed to them. And so when the Fed does that, they are an, on an 11 to 1 basis saying, we prefer to, to hand money to white households over black households. How is that not inherently racist, right? In this whole era of Black Lives Matter, I think the Federal Reserve has to answer for that and really needs to, to step up to the plate and talk about how its policies of boosting... Uh, one group of people over another, how that in any way is justified, justifiable, anything like that. Um, so, and if we look here at, at stoking these social fires, you know, uh, Wall Street Journal, no, Bloomberg article talking about why this rally is so unloved. Whoops, not that one. Keep very slow selecting new pens. Um, so the, we see here, look, 
the Fed gave the markets a lot of help. Yes, they did. Look at all the billions of dollars here. And oh, look, at the same time, uh, S&P uh, went up crazy high. And of course, we could also say bonds went up and other financial assets like that. So that's what the Federal Reserve has been doing, right? And so when we back all the way up and we talk about um, what happens here and about how this web, our complex human societies, can really fray, it really comes down to growing economic inequality. And this is something as high inequality, it says here, high inequality is corrosive of social cooperation and willingness to compromise. And we know that because that's just how we're wired. That's a fundamental attribute of being a primate. And instead of sort of noting that, uh, the Federal Reserve denies that they've actually been doing that, F minus for you, um, lies about it again. How can you even remotely argue, Jerome Powell, <laughs> come on, that uh, when the top 1% owns such an outrageously larger share of financial assets than anybody else and that they're distributed so unevenly across different racial uh, aspects in the United States, how can you possibly say that you're not stoking the flames of inequality and leading to the social tensions that are out there. Of course you are. Of course you are. You, Federal Reserve, you are the proud owner of unfair wealth distribution and all picking the winners and losers. And by the way, you're picking the elites and you're picking different races over other races. That's what the Federal Reserve is doing. And I don't know why more reporters aren't asking these sorts of questions, aren't given the, you know, given the hard heave to, to, to uh, the central bank, because that's fundamentally what they're doing. And if we look at the Fed a little bit more deeply, um, this just came out today, fortunately, because I was hoping an article like this would come out, and it just came out to serve this purpose for this particular uh, update that I'm doing here. And the Fed has a, just a really profound lack of diversity, not, not, not just racial diversity, but uh, almost everybody on there has got a JD degree or, you know, and um, so they've got a legal degree and um, or they came up through academia. But how many industrialists are on there? How many small business owners serve on the Fed? How many people who are farmers or who have have a really a very different, very strong sense of what the actual productive value and backbone of this nation is? How many of those types of people serve on the Fed boards? The answer is zero right now. Um, but uh, let's uh, look at this one. The Fed's first black president calls on policymakers to step up. So I was pretty interested in this. Like, okay, maybe they're, maybe they're actually going to crack the kimono open and talk about how deeply unfair their policies are. That'd be pretty bold. So let's see what Raphael Bostic says here. First black Federal pres Reserve president in the central bank's 106-year history. Whoops. I guess, uh, I guess the Fed has uh, not really been all that uh, interested in diversity. Um, over its 106 year history, has rarely talked about race in the three years he's run the Atlanta Fed. Uh, there are 12 regional Fed um, uh, offices, branches, if you will. So uh, the Atlanta Fed is one of the 12. So uh, Raphael Bostic is the president of the Atlanta Fed. There's also a New York Fed, a San Francisco Fed. You know, there's all different 12 of them, right? But recent events, including last month's uh, police killing of George Floyd, changed that. People are wanting to have this conversation, Bostic said in a wide-ranging interview. Yes, I do. I totally want to have this conversation. Let's have it. In an economic crisis that's disproportionately hurting minorities and the poor, he said policymakers need to speak out against racism, take action to create more opportunities, encourage other efforts when their own tools are lacking. Okay, I'm, I'm with you. I'm cautiously with you on this so far. Bostic said he's looking at a proposal for the Fed to target black unemployment which was still rising last month. What? Even as the overall rate began to climb from its lockdown peak, he's also worried about black-owned businesses surviving the pandemic because they went into this with less capital, and so the level of distress they're going to face is going to be greater. So what is the Federal Reserve doing? First off, don't target black unemployment. That's not your job. Um, and second of all, if you could just stop creating a gigantic wealth gap because it's going to be so hard to climb up from under that. The Fed pumps money, pumps money, makes the super elites even more elite. All that wealth funnels up to uh, Wall Street types, the 0.1%, forget the 1%, the 0.1%. And then once it's there, sticky fingers, it stays there. And then the next thing you know, um, all these poor struggling uh, businesses owned by people of whatever color are going to find that they're outcompeted by rich, deep pocketed people who've been handed all of that wealth by the Federal Reserve. And then how do we undo that? Right? How do we undo that? So yeah, Raphael, good ideas. But you know what I would say is uh, before you target black unemployment, stop creating a wealth gap. Stop. Just stop. Every day it just gets worse. Right? 
Um, Bostic said he's looking. Oh, I already I already talked about that. Um, I tucked that in on that other one. You know, it was interesting though. I, I liked seeing this now before they scrubbed the comments. So I got in there early on this article, and uh, the first few comments I saw on this were were I thought revealing. Uh, Joseph wrote right away, kind of ironic that Bostic belongs to an organization that has caused the major wealth gap that is fueling the fire. Hey, Joseph, I'm with you on that. Johnny Dollar wrote, be honest, Mr. Bostic, America's bank capitalism isn't working for anyone, black, white, red, yellow, or brown. It only works for the ruling class. Capitalism is fundamentally flawed if you can't own that. Rearranging the chairs in the Titanic isn't going to help anyone. Bostic's surprise appointment, a lot of eyebrows went up, does point to the elites worrying and trying to change the subject to race. So that's an interesting point. Maybe it has nothing to do with race. It's just the elites against everybody else, and that has an accidental racial component that comes with it. But certainly I think the Fed has a lot to answer for because they are not working for America if that means working for everybody in America. They're clearly working for a very tiny, tiny elite. Um, and uh, that needs to be pointed out. Lori writes, uh, shouldn't Bostic, by focusing on the fact, or I guess be focusing on the fact that the Fed's balance sheet has ballooned from 3.7 to 7.2 trillion in nine months? Is he not concerned that his institution is now using Fed funds to buy U.S. corporate bonds, essentially handpicking winners and losers? Nah. Instead, we have a Fed president who's focusing his efforts on racial issues instead of the financial ones these appointed to track. Great. All right, uh, so you can see here that uh, even in the midst of uh, an era where the Fed ought to be about as on pitch as they can be, they're proving to be ridiculously tone deaf about all sorts of things. Uh, The inequality itself, the structural issues about how capitalism is now broken, uh, other things like that. So uh, once again, I just got to say shame on you, Jerome Powell, for just (laughs) the Fed policies absolutely don't add to inequality. Get out of here. Just get get the heck out of here with that. They absolutely do. And by the way, Jerome, there's a racial component to this because the, when the Fed's picking winners and losers, it's preferentially funneling money to white households uh, instead, of, uh, instead of equally across all ha- households. And you know that. You absolutely know that. Which why I think this is all a very dangerous situation. Uh, it's, we've got a social breakdown coming. I don't see any way around it. Feds, uh, this is the way I think that uh, Jerome Powell basically, he's got his Marie Antoinette moment at this point. He's basically come out and said, let them eat stocks, right? And that was, this was my let them eat stocks moment. (laughs) Feds policies absolutely don't add to inequality. Yeah, Jeffrey Dahmer absolutely didn't eat those people. Come on, this is awful. You can't say stuff that's that obviously wrong. You just can't do that, right? And of course, the concern about all of this is that uh, is is based on this Turchin uh, uh, article here in his research, which says that we are held together by this invisible web of mutual trust and social cooperation. And this web can fray easily, and that could lead to outright social collapse. So that idea of trust, mutual trust, and social cooperation, mutual trust. What the Federal Reserve is doing is broken our trust in a big, big way. They're picking winners and losers. They've, they've just, I'm sure they're just so stuck in their little bubble of thought that this all makes perfect sense to them. But from out here where I'm looking, it's very clear that by picking winners and losers, by saying big corporations get access to billions and billions, the Federal Reserve, just so you know, they bailed out hedge funds who had made really bad bets on um, the direction of financial assets. They bailed out the holders of mortgage-backed securities who ought to be taking losses but not on the Fed's watch. They're bailing them out. They're bailing out big Wall Street banks. They're bailing out the uber wealthy. They're making sure that gains flow preferentially to the top 0.1% at the expense of everybody else. So that's not a kind, gentle sort of uh, we're all in this together sort of an organization, right? Which is one of the things Peter Turchin talked about. There is a sense that we are not all in this together. There's an us and a them. There are those who uh, get cucumbers. And there are those who get grapes. And the Federal Reserve is doing everything it can to assure that you get cucumbers and a very, very tiny minority get grapes. And that is a very dangerous situation because that goes until it breaks at some point in time. And I don't think the Federal Reserve, this is a picture of a Federal Reserve building, I don't think they actually get that. I don't think they really understand what they're up to. I wish I could get them to watch this little two and a half minute video right here because if you understand this video, you understand why what the Federal Reserve is doing is so incredibly dangerous at this point in time. You can't create vast social injustices and live in a a stable, safe, prosperous country at the same time. 
So I know the Fed thinks it's out there trying to preserve wealth by making the stock market go up, but they're actually destroying prosperity because they're creating the conditions where we lose that social cohesion, the trust, and the sense of cooperation. And I can feel all of that just in the protests, but also in the halls of power. Just a vast amount of overproduction of elites, a little bit too much competition, a loss of trust. And it's this gentleman right here who's really uh, pouring fuel all over that fire right now. And I deplore that. I think that's a bad thing to do, which means I'm going to have to say the Federal Reserve really lacks any integrity. They have this deep, deep ideological rigidity down here, which is really rooted on the idea that the wealthy are special and that they ought to be even specialer and by becoming wealthier at everybody else's expense. That's too ideologically rigid. No good. No good for our future. And I'm really unhappy about it because I, I don't – we could do this the other way. We could do this the easy way. Want to know what the easy way is? I can tell you what the easy way is because we already talked about it. The easy way – uh, is for me to get this red X off of here, and we'll just read it all over again. In some cases, however, societies come through relatively unscathed by adopting a series of judicious reforms initiated by elites who understand that we are all in this boat together. That's how we do this. That is absolutely not what's happening here with the Federal Reserve. Absolutely not happening at all. All right, conclusions for today. Hey, we're totally not out of the woods yet with SARS-CoV-2. Hate to say it, just not uh, seeing the lockdowns in China. By the way, I think China is lying again. I, I don't. I don't think they had uh, just a handful of cases. Uh, I don't. You know, they, the way they shut down thousands of flights and um, the the ham handedness of the response, the heavy handedness of the response again. I think they're having trouble with it too. I don't believe that uh, this uh, virus is going away. I think we're just going to have to learn to live with it. I think some places will learn to live with it better than others, but mm, the United States has got a long road in front of it. Secondary infections? Oh, man, I don't want to hear about that. All right, the Federal Reserve, hey, it picks winners and losers. It's what it does. It's not a wealth-creating organization. It's a redistributive organization. It takes from Party A and gives to Party B, right? It's taking from Grandma uh, you know, and, and her uh, retirement savings and uh, living on a fixed income or something like that and handing those pennies that are harvested off of all those uh, uh, retirement funds that are getting just hammered by 0% interest rates. And it hands all those pennies in a funneled sort of a way to big banks and uh, giant speculators and leveraged participants in the markets and all that stuff. Okay, that's what they do. Uh, they are already selecting uh, the already wealthy and elite over everybody else. Um, that's what they do. Uh, so wealthy, let me put that Y in there. So that's what they do. So they've already said, the Federal Reserve has said, hey, we, we think the, the already wealthy and elite ought to be even wealthier and uh, more elite. Um, they are selecting white households over black and Hispanic households. No question about that. That's what they're doing by uh, promoting asset inflation. Um, and because of that, they're playing with social fire. They're giving grapes to a very, very small group of people. And there's a lot of monkeys out here getting cucumbers. And we're not happy with it. The Federal Reserve... Therefore, is entirely lacking in integrity, and they are the source of our problems. They're not out there fighting problems. They're creating the problems. That's that's the, the ire I have about all this. And I, People, people need to wake up about what the Federal Reserve is doing because, you know, if we don't wake up in time, eventually we wake up in a broken society and one that goes through even larger convulsions than the ones we're seeing right now. If you don't like what you're seeing today, let the Federal Reserve keep doing what it's doing for five more years, and you're going to hate the future you come into there. All right, what do you do about that? Well, this is really kind of seems insignificant, but it, it counts. Um, get a t-shirt, could join the movement, uh, resilience and uh, maybe the resistance. What is resilience all about? Resilience is about taking yourself out of that game that the Federal Reserve is playing. I'm not going to expose myself to them as much as possible. You take your money out of that system and you put it into real, hard, productive assets. Like what? Like our new garden. Hey, I told you last time that um, uh, here's a picture of the people who came here wearing their resilience T-shirts. Uh, and uh, this is the state of the garden. <laughs> here it is just a month ago over here on on this side. Here I am planting these little things. And uh, here they are today. It's good. It's doing great. Um, we're getting uh, some really great growth out of the garden this year. And, of course, remember if you're going to uh, be out and about and you think you might get exposed to COVID and you don't really want it because who does? Uh, remember things like quercetin, zinc. D3, selenium, all proven to uh, boost your immune terrain of your body so that if you do get exposed to the virus, you'll have a much, much uh, kinder, better, gentler, shorter run of it than somebody who has a poorly prepared terrain, maybe by eating the standard American diet 
aka the SAD diet. As well, vitamin C and acetylcysteine, and of course, my go-to, Gobble Mountain Organic Elderberry Syrup. Uh, Whenever I feel that tickle in the throat, just a little of this, and uh, three times that first day, three times the second day, and man, I am in much better shape as a consequence of that. All right, that's all I have for today, so thank you everybody for listening, and we will be back with you next Tuesday. Hi folks, this is Adam Taggart, Chris's co-founder at Peak Prosperity. To get your own resilient shirt, simply go to peakprosperity.com slash shirts. Each shirt is made of 100% organic cotton and produced in the USA. And when your shirt arrives, please send us a photo of you wearing it if you feel comfortable doing so. We'll add you to our wall of proud Peak Prosperity members who are showing the world that resilience is the way to a better future. Thanks for watching.